everyone, it's Katrina. Noah's Ark. If the biblical story of Noah's Ark is a real thing that happened, where is the Ark today? Most recently, a team of evangelical Christians made the claim that they discovered its remains hidden underneath layers of volcanic debris. They made the discovery in Turkey, in the exact spot where the Bible claims Noah's Ark came to a rest. Archaeologists are dismissing the claims as nonsense. But what if they're wrong? Paul Zemansky, an archaeologist who specializes in the Middle East, said he doesn't know of any expedition that searched for the Ark and ever found it. And yet, according to the group called Noah's Ark Ministries International, the Ark is right there, hidden in plain sight. They admitted that they can't be 100% sure, but they are at least 99.9% .9 positive. The Ark is supposedly buried at a whopping 13,000 feet above sea level, near the peak of Mount Ararat in Turkey. It would be one thing to make a guess, but the team says they found real physical physical evidence. They allegedly excavated wooden compartments buried near the top of the mountain in 2007 and 2008. Based on the Bible's description of the gigantic ship, it was partitioned into a lot of different spaces to keep all the various animals. The team believes the wooden structures they found were those very animal cages. However, they haven't shown any proof and have kept the exact location of the discovery a secret. The Book of Genesis suggests the Ark landed somewhere near the ancient kingdom of Urartu, located in what is now Turkey. People have always associated the mountain with the place where the Ark stopped, going back about 3,000 years. But there's never been verifiable proof of a biblical flood in Turkey. Most scholars say even if the Ark was real, the wood would have been used to build houses by Noah and his family. If there were real wooden structures found in the mountain in 2007, most archaeologists say there would be shrines built by early Christians. They could have been to commemorate the spot where they thought Noah's Ark landed, the discovery is still extremely controversial. Until somebody digs a giant boat out of the ground, we are never going to know for sure. What do you think? Do you think we'll ever find Noah's Ark? Let me know in the comments. It's shout out time! I want to give a big shout out to Simon Rainbow and to Patrick from Holland. Love you guys and thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. The House of Peter The Bible doesn't go into a lot of detail about Jesus Christ. Christ's life as a child. It mostly talks about him as an adult. We don't get to see much about his day-to-day -day life, but there is enough in there to figure out some things. For example, we know he spent most of his adult life in Capernaum. This was a tight-knit community of fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. And it was here, on the edge of that sea, that Jesus Christ started his own ministry at a local synagogue. He recruited several fishermen to be his loyal disciples, and thus started his journey to crucifixion. In the years after the death of Christ, pilgrims traveled to the fishing village of Capernaum. According to their writings, there was once a beautifully preserved ancient synagogue which was believed to be the building where Christ first taught. And while the ruins of this building are long gone, its legend lives on. But there is another important building in the fishing village that scientists have been desperate to find. That would be the House of Peter, Jesus' human stepfather. The Bible suggests Peter's house was in Capernaum. After all, Jesus must have had a home there unless he lived on the streets. Archaeologists believe they may have just found that very house. Italian excavators working in Capernaum uncovered the remnants of a small abode buried underneath the foundation of a Byzantine church. It appears to date back to the 1st century BC. The house looks simple, just like any other house from the early Roman period. It had a few small rooms around a central courtyard and it was totally plain. Except it was Archaeologists were shocked to see that the house went through an alteration. It started out simply enough, but then was renovated. The main room was completely plastered, something very rare for 2,000 years ago. Plaster was expensive. There was also a change in pottery. Instead of cooking pots and bowls, there were storage jars and oil lamps. Everything points to the residents transforming from a home to a place of community gatherings. This suggests it was Jesus' house, which, as an adult, he transformed to organize the first Christian meetings. 
Unless researchers find the names of Jesus and Peter on some coffee mugs, there isn't any way to prove the theory beyond a reasonable doubt. Still, this does look like the House of Peter, the physical birthplace of Christianity, the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III. In December 1846, an excavation team conducting an archaeological study at the Mesopotamian ruins of Nimrud found something extraordinary. Sir Austin Henry Layard was the man who uncovered the Black Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III. It's currently on display on the ground floor of the British Museum in London. Thousands of years ago, it was erected in one of the greatest Assyrian cities of all time. Even after the last century and a half of archaeological advancements, the Black Obelisk is still considered the only complete Assyrian obelisk ever discovered. The obelisk itself is quite large and impressive. It is a thick and heavy chunk of black limestone built in the year 825 BC. It was placed in the central courtyard inside the Assyrian capital. Its top was made to look like a ziggurat, the Mesopotamian version of a pyramid. But it's not the obelisk itself that's so exciting, but rather the inscription written on it in the ancient Akkadian language. The monument was made to commemorate 31 years of successful military military campaigns overseen by Shalmaneser III. He ruled Assyria between 858 and 824 BC. The obelisk is decorated in scenes that match those inscriptions. There are a total of five narrative scenes describing the king's triumph over the kings of other nations. One of those inscriptions describes how Shalmaneser III triumphed over Jehu of the House of Omri, king of Israel. The image that comes with the inscription shows King Jehu offering a huge tribute of gold gold, silver, tin, and the staff of the king's hand. This was meant to be humiliating for the Israelites, showing them in such a pitiful state, having to pay for their safety. If you're wondering what this has to do with the Bible, it was a big deal when it was first discovered. The obelisk was one of the first pieces of archaeological evidence that biblical figures were real people, even the obscure ones. This shows that Jehu of the House of Omri wasn't just a character in a story, but a real person, and this substantiated the Bible in a way that had never been done before. The Quest for the Holy Grail The Holy Grail was the vessel that Jesus Christ drank from during the Last Supper. That final and fateful meal, when he sat around the table with his disciples, he sipped from a jewel-encrusted goblet. This same goblet was then used to collect his blood after he was stabbed in the side with a spear. It is the literal Holy Grail of Holy Grails. But there is no historical account of what happened to it after the Bible. According to medieval history expert, Margarita Torres, it's currently inside the Basilica of San Isodoro in León, Spain. Margarita says she and another historian named José Miguel Ortega del Río came to their conclusion after three years of investigation. They believe the Holy Grail is the goblet known as the Infanta Doña Urraca. This bedazzled piece of glassware was named in honor of King Ferdinand I's daughter, who lived in the 11th century. So how in the world did the researchers come to such a conclusion? They were looking through the Islamic remains in the basilica when they found some mysterious Egyptian parchment. These parchments spoke of a valuable holy chalice that was taken from Jerusalem back to Cairo. The chalice was then given to an emir ruling over one of the Islamic kingdoms of Spain. The chalice was then gifted to King Ferdinand, who gave it the name of his daughter. For the past 900 years, it hasn't left the basilica. It's been open to public viewing in the basement since the 1950s. The relic is made from gold and onyx and dusted with precious stones. Scientific dating has put the creation of the cup somewhere in the first century. That coincides exactly with when it would have been used by Christ at the Last Supper. The date matches. There are historical records to back it up, but is it really the Holy Grail? What do you think? Let me know in the comments. The Magdalene Synagogue Researchers conducting excavations on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee recently unearthed a new synagogue in Migdal. The synagogue is 2,000 years old, situated in the ruins of the town where Mary Magdalene was supposedly born. It's the second synagogue of its kind discovered in the ruins and could help shed some light on the religious lives of Jews in the area before the rise of Jesus. Excavation co-director Dina 
Dina Absalom Gorney from the University of Haifa said she can imagine Mary Magdalene and her family going to the local synagogue to participate in communal events. Before Mary got in touch with Jesus, she was likely a Jew like everyone else in the town. But then she met Jesus, and that's where things get confusing and controversial. Some say Mary Magdalene was nothing but a prostitute who played a negligible role in the life of Jesus. But there are religious texts out there that suggest Mary Magdalene was much more. For example, the Gospel of Mary, discovered in Egypt as part of the Nag Hammadi collection in the 1940s. This ancient text suggests Jesus and Mary were married, not just romantically involved, but fully married. That would make Mary Magdalene a significantly important person in the life of Jesus Christ, though of course, the church has denied it. Whatever role Mary played in Jesus' later life, she started her life in the small Jewish settlement of Migdal. This newly discovered synagogue is now the first time two such structures have been unearthed from the Second Temple period in the same town. It was built from volcanic basalt and limestone, consisting of a main hall and two smaller rooms. One of the rooms was for storing Torah scrolls, and the other may have been for purification rituals. It's not for certain that Mary attended the synagogue, but it is highly likely. Both of the known synagogues in Migdal existed until the Jewish rebellion of 67 AD. That was when the Roman Empire really put their foot down on Israel and its people. I wanted to give a big thank you to Neko's Corner. Thanks so much for letting us be a part of your day. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. The Pool of Bethesda Jesus performed many miracles in the Bible. Among his most famous is the miracle healing recounted in the Gospel of John. John 5, 2-9 tells the story of how Jesus Christ healed a paralytic man at the Bethesda pool. Weirdly enough, it's not the only miracle Jesus decided to perform at a pool. The Gospel of John also tells the story of Jesus healing a blind man in the Siloam pool. It likely had something to do with the fact that pools were community gathering places 2,000 years ago. If you wanted to get the latest gossip while scrubbing your back, the pool was the place to do it. It's not too surprising that Jesus chose these crowded public places to perform miracles. In 2005, archaeologists identified the Siloam Pool. It was a huge deal to uncover the physical place where one of the Bible's greatest miracles happened. One of the bigger shocks was when they figured out the pool was a mikvah. It wasn't just a local spa, it was a Jewish ritual bath. We know where the Bethesda Pool is already. It's a complex archaeological site in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate. It was discovered by archaeologist Konrad Schick in the late 19th century. He found a massive massive water tank just 100 feet from the famous St. Anne's Church. Further excavations occurred in the 20th century, uncovering the remains of churches from the Byzantine era and from the days of the Crusades. It turned out Hadrian's temple contained the healing pools and had been demolished and built over by the Byzantine church. It's extremely complicated. The best way to think of it is that the Pool of Bethesda was incorporated into multiple religious buildings over about 2,000 years of history and all the ruins are intermingled with one another. We'll never know if Jesus Christ truly did heal a paralytic man here. There isn't much archaeological evidence that can prove that kind of thing. But we do know this story was taken very seriously. When the Christians took control of Jerusalem after the fall of the Roman Empire, they added chapels and churches all around the pool. It was visited by pilgrims who themselves wanted to experience the healing waters. But little did most people realize, the pool started as a mikvah. Christ was performing his miracles at Jewish baths around Jerusalem. The Dead Sea Scrolls Secret Text During the craze to excavate every last fragment of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1950s, researchers found something unusual. They came across a fragment without any writing on it. It was a blank piece of the puzzle, so nobody was all that interested in it. The blank fragment was donated by archaeologists to a British researcher, and that was it. At least until now. Researchers have now used impressive new technology to unveil the script that's been on the fragment this entire time. It wasn't blank, the words were just invisible. 
The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered by accident by local Bedouins in Israel in the 1940s. The story goes that a couple of shepherds were looking for lost sheep in the desert when they shattered a piece of pottery, found a scroll fragment, and the rest is history. Twelve miles from Jerusalem in the dry and barren caves of the Qumran Desert, archaeologists and thieves descended like locusts. They picked the place apart, gathering thousands of fragments of scrolls containing the oldest known writings of the Hebrew Bible. The scrolls were created by a mysterious Jewish sect 2,000 years ago. In the early days of excavations, archaeologists often gave away fragments to collectors, museums, and people with money. Recently, Dennis Mitzi from the University of Malta and his colleagues decided to track those pieces down. They suspected some lost evidence escaped scrutiny during the chaos. They tracked down all kinds of artifacts and ultimately found the blank piece of the Dead Sea Scrolls stashed at the John Ryland's library, where it's been since 1997. Using multispectral imaging to pick up various wavelengths on the electromagnetic spectrum, the team revealed text on the fragments. There isn't very much text, nothing to cause a stir or compose an entirely new biblical book. The fragments appear to be lines of text from the book of Ezekiel. Tell Dan Steele. In the early 1990s, archaeologists uncovered fragments of a mysterious monument built nearly 3,000 years ago. The fragments, when put together, create the Tel Dan Steel, a slab of black basalt erected by a king of Armenia in northern Israel. Although nobody knows the name of the author because it wasn't written on the monument, it was most likely King Hazael of Aram Damascus. What the monument does say in the Aramaic inscription is that Syria and Israel were at war and that the god Hadad made the author of this steel victorious over Israel. During the fighting, the inscription says that King Jeram of Israel was killed, along with his ally King Isaiah of the House of David. The inscription created great interest after it was discovered because of this one reference to the House of David. It's the earliest known confirmation in the record of the Davidic dynasty. This has been a huge boon to biblical archaeologists. The steel found at the ancient site of Tel Dan appears to confirm that certain events in the Old Testament were real historical events. The biggest difference is that in the Bible, Jehu, future king of Israel, is the one who crushed King Joram and King Ahaziah. The way archaeologists have rectified this is by suggesting King Hazael took credit for Jehu's military prowess. But the big takeaway from the discovery is the confirmation of the House of David, the line of great rulers that started with David, the man who slayed Goliath. What's your favorite story from the Bible? Let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe! The Sudarium of Oviedo The Sudarium of Oviedo is a blood-stained piece of cloth that dates back at least 1,300 years, according to radiocarbon dating. It can currently be found at the Cathedral of San Salvador in Oviedo, Spain. The reason the bloody piece of cloth is so important is that according to legend, it was wrapped around Jesus Christ's head in the moments after he died, as is said in John 26 7. The main issue with this holy relic is that it doesn't date back far enough. It's definitely a bloody rag, but the blood seems to be from 700 AD. That was over 700 years after Jesus Christ died. However, the lab responsible for the dating did admit the result could be wrong. They said oil contamination may have resulted in late dating, but this almost felt like a way to save themselves from the religious community's scrutiny. The closest parallel here is the Shroud of Turin, the much more famous alleged burial shroud of Jesus Christ that has his face imprinted onto it. The Shroud of Turin has been a holy relic cherished by members of the Catholic Church for centuries, but it too has never been properly dated back to the death of Christ. And the truth is nobody knows where it came from. In the Gospel of John, there was said to be a face cloth present in the empty tomb after Jesus vanished. This cloth was supposedly picked up, taken away, and then stashed in a cave near Jerusalem for centuries. It was then taken from Palestine in 614 AD. The cloth traveled to Alexandria, was carried through North Africa, and arrived in Spain about two years later. It's been there ever since. Q Source 
Most Christian scholars agree the first written gospel was Mark. However, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke have material extremely similar to what's in the Gospel of Mark. There is also some common material in Luke and Matthew that can't be found in Mark. Scholars believe that when Matthew and Luke wrote down their stories about Jesus, they copied much of what was already written in Mark. This is because they follow the same narrative outline. Sometimes the sayings are repeated word for word, but there are also snippets of information and teachings from Jesus Christ in Matthew and Luke that appear to have been inspired by a different source. This is called the Q source, and scholars say it could be a different gospel published alongside the Gospel of Mark, one that has no surviving copy. Researchers are a bit stumped. Matthew and Luke are extremely similar gospels. They both appear to have copied from the same source material. One is definitely the Gospel of Mark, however, we don't know what the second thing they copied their information from was. The best guess is that there was another gospel from which they were inspired fired, let's say. This supposed Q source has never been identified. Scholars don't know if it was a real physical text or an oral gospel passed down verbally. This brings us to the Nag Hammadi Library, a collection of mysterious texts discovered in Egypt in 1945. This is where the Gospel of Mary was found, which says Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene were married. The huge collection of early Christian texts is evidence that there were a lot of different documents circulating in early Christian communities. They had a lot more religious content to read than anyone ever realized. One of these early texts was probably the Q source, the elusive base material for the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. King Solomon King Solomon was the famous biblical ruler who established the first temple in Jerusalem before the Babylonians destroyed it in the year 587 BC. Solomon is one of the most important figures in the Old Testament, also called the Hebrew Bible. He was the son of David, the very same David who defeated the giant Goliath. He ruled over ancient Israel, was extremely wealthy, and yet was also very wise. In fact, Solomon's wisdom was only surpassed by the wisdom of Jesus of Nazareth. In the Quran, Solomon is an Islamic prophet. Some religious sects even consider him a magician and an exorcist, and for the past 250 years, Solomon has been a great source of intrigue. For historians, understanding the truth of King Solomon has always been a difficult task. He was supposedly a great builder and was responsible for many building projects throughout the Near East. But according to Professor Tom Meyer from Bible Shasta College and Graduate School, there's little physical evidence of King Solomon's supposed great deeds. At least there was little physical evidence until some recent discoveries. Archaeologists found similar building features at the three sites of Hazor, Megiddo, and Gezer. These are the three cities which, according to the Bible, King Solomon raised at the same time he raised the first temple. The cities were built as major administrative centers along road junctions and a busy highway. Tom Meyer compared the three cities to New York, Chicago, and San Francisco, positioned along U.S. Highway 80. These similar building features show that someone built all three cities at around the same time. They appear to have been built during the reign of King Solomon, which could prove the biblical accounts of Solomon's vast building projects. The Pompeii Safe Something mysterious happened 2,000 years ago in a wealthy suburb of Pompeii. Just as Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD and covered the Italian city in molten rock and hot ash, a robbery took place. It happened as the eruption was ongoing, and opportunistic thieves were trying to pillage what they could. In the 1980s, archaeologists came across an ancient house in Pompeii that contained two groups of bodies. One of the groups was decked out in fancy jewelry, and the other had nothing. Researchers then found an ancient safe, a kind of prehistoric strongbox used by ultra-rich citizens to safeguard their most precious belongings. Researchers are fairly certain that as Mount Vesuvius erupted, thieves targeted the household of elite citizens in an attempt to steal their stuff. But before the thieves could make it out with the strongbox, both parties met their doom at the hands of the erupting volcano. It took many years for archaeologists to excavate, investigate, and restore the Pompeii safe. They now know it was the epitome of home security for ancient Rome. It had a four-stage locking mechanism, 
and was so strong it was only broken because of one of the worst natural disasters in history. Another interesting thing is that researchers suggest the presence of such a safe could mean that crime was rampant across the city. Wealthy people were desperate to protect their goods. It's shout out time! I want to say a big thank you to Nora Gibson and Mr. Jeremy McAllister for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about amazing discoveries. We'd love to have you! The Pharaoh's Box Archaeologists from the University of Warsaw recently discovered an ancient chest in Egypt from 3,500 years ago. They were exploring near the famous Hatshepsut Temple in Deir el-Bahari when they came across a stone chest hidden in a cavity underneath some rocks. The mysterious chest, which appears to have been hidden on purpose, looked like a totally ordinary stone. It was only because the archaeologists were well trained that they differentiated the box from the rubble. It turned out to be a treasure chest, containing several mysterious items wrapped in ancient linens. The team pulled out a goose skeleton, a goose egg, and a wooden casket holding an ibis egg wrapped in canvas. They then found another bundle beside the stone chest. This one contained a wooden box with the name of Pharaoh Thutmose II written on its side in hieroglyphs. So what does all this weirdness mean? What's with all the bird eggs? Professor Nowinski with the university believes these strange treasures were offerings to Thutmose II who was the husband of Queen Hatshepsut. The professor also says the artifacts are suggestive of a nearby tomb, hopefully the tomb of Thutmose II, which has never been found. Aztec Carvings Mysterious carvings left behind by the ancient Aztecs were recently uncovered deep in the bowels of Mexico City. Inside a tunnel from the 17th century, archaeologists found drawings created from before the Spanish conquistadors arrived in Mexico. The ancient drawings and paintings in the tunnel were created by the Aztecs in the days when their cities were filled with beautiful temples, gruesome sacrifices, and tall pyramids. The tunnel was part of an unfinished dike system commissioned by the Aztec emperor Moctezuma I. The purpose of the dike system was to control flooding that frequently occurred because of the lakes surrounding the current capital of Mexico. But it wasn't long after construction started that Hernán Cortés arrived with his troops and began fighting the Aztec. The dike was abandoned, then later rebuilt in the 17th century by the Spanish. So, how did images drawn by the Aztec workers 300 years earlier make it onto the facade of the tunnel? It's all about repurposing. When the Spanish finished the dike system, they used repurposed stone with Aztec symbols and images drawn on them. Some of the images found in the tunnel include a war shield called a chimali, the head of a bird, and the flint point of a weapon, the Temple of Kanum. When a team of researchers with an Egyptian archaeological mission began to excavate the Temple of Kanum, they had no idea they were going to discover layers of history hidden beneath. The Temple of Kanum is located in the ancient Egyptian town of Esna, later called Latopolis by the Greeks. The temple was constructed by Ptolemy V, then later improved by the Romans. It was dedicated to Kanu, god of the source of the Nile. Within the temple, the team identified a calendar used to mark annual festivities, religious hymns scrawled on the walls, and what appeared to be images of crocodiles and rams. But the recent excavations revealed much more. The archaeologists found another building from the Roman era. It proved to be a bathhouse a circular brick building made from sandstone. They were able to identify the remains of its original columns, which once formed a magnificent gated entrance. It looks like the bathhouse was fed by water flowing to the structure in shallow channels, and it even used a Roman heating system to turn the place into a sauna. The really weird part about all of this is that the Romans built their bathhouse directly connected to what should have been a sacred temple. It goes to show just how quickly something sacred can be turned into a glorified spa. Goldsmith's Toolkit Archaeologists believe they have just discovered an ancient goldsmith's toolbox in a burial mound near Stonehenge. The supposed toolkit consists of a collection of very smooth stones, polished chunks of rock that were uncovered in the burial mound after 4,000 years. To ordinary people, these artifacts would look like nothing but rocks. But to keen-eyed archaeologists, 
These rocks were the trade tools of an ancient master goldsmith. But we should go back to the beginning. The alleged toolkit was uncovered in 1802 at the site of Stonehenge in England. But nobody knew what they were until now, when scientists were finally able to do a microscopic analysis of the rocks and primitive axes found two centuries ago. The analysis revealed small traces of gold, along with wear markings. This proves that they were used by someone to hammer raw gold into smooth sheets. But the discovery keeps getting better and better. The toolkit was discovered along with a deposit of pierced animal bones, which experts say were likely part of a shaman's ritual garb. What we're seeing here is the ancient landscape of Stonehenge coming to life. Buried in this mound were the tools of an expert craftsman and a tribal shaman from around 1850 BC. These were likely important members of the Wessex culture that flourished in small primitive villages near Stonehenge after it was finished. Viking Boat Graves Archaeologists discovered a pair of Viking boat graves in a farmer's field in Norway. The find was a little unusual because the boats were twins, both buried in the same Viking grave. Most Viking ship graves were made for just one person, usually someone extremely important like a chieftain. The most beloved and powerful members of society were buried inside of longboats, which to the Vikings were some of the most meaningful things in the world. But when researchers dug up this grave, they found two boats. One contained a man and one contained a woman. Even weirder is that they were buried 100 years apart. The woman died in the 9th century and was buried with artifacts from Ireland likely acquired during a Viking raid. Underneath the woman, who has yet to be identified, was a man in his own boat buried in the 8th century. Archaeologists think the Vikings were reusing the burial mound, possibly because they didn't want to make a new one. It was a lot of work and a lot easier to just have one person inside the grave of another. As for who the man was, that's still a mystery. But based on the style of sword found in his grave, he may have been a Merovingian king. The Merovingians ruled huge parts of Western Europe in the Dark Ages. Either this guy was a king, or he somehow acquired one of their swords. The Egyptian Commander A team of Czech archaeologists were conducting an excavation near the Giza Plateau when they unearthed the mysterious tomb of a long-dead Egyptian commander. The commander lived 2,500 years ago, during the late 26th or early 27th dynasty. This was right around the same time as King Solomon in Israel. Thanks to information discovered in his tomb, researchers were quick to learn not only his name, but many aspects of his life as well. His name was Wa'ib Ra Mary Nate, and he was the commander of a battalion formed entirely of foreign mercenaries. 2,500 years ago was the beginning of the first age of globalism in the ancient world. This was a time when people were just starting to travel vast distances on well-trodden trails, and people were moving from one to another. The Egyptian commander was in charge of one of the first groups of soldiers to represent Egypt in battle, even though they weren't Egyptian themselves. The commander's tomb was uncovered less than 8 miles from the pyramids of Giza. His tomb was made to be magnificent. It was found to have two levels, with the sole purpose of housing the commander's corpse. His body was hidden in a smaller shaft dug through the solid bedrock below the main shaft. When all was said and done, he was about 52 feet beneath the surface. This guy was very important, so much that they dug as deep as possible to ensure his soul would forever be at rest. Unfortunately, they didn't dig deep enough. Archaeologists confirmed that Wa'ib Ra Mary Nate's body was removed over 1,000 years ago by tomb raiders who had already broken in and stolen everything of value. Ancient Projectiles Archaeologists from Oregon State University have discovered what they say are the oldest projectiles ever found in the Americas. They uncovered 13 projectile points, each one razor-sharp and designed to kill. The tips of these points range from between 0.5 to 2 inches long and may have been used for either hunting or warfare. They were discovered alongside the Salmon River in Idaho and have been dated at 15,700 years old. That's according to the official Carbon-14 dating. 
It's amazing because that date places these projectiles as over 3,000 years older than other similar artifacts found in North America. Lauren Davis, the leader of the archaeological team, says the discovery is very important because it helps to understand the earliest people of America. Discovering such well-made artifacts proves that the first Americans were technologically advanced and capable of complex thinking. And here's where things get even more exciting. The 13 projectile points are nearly identical to similar points found in Hokkaido, Japan 20,000 years ago. It seems pretty obvious there is a connection here between the first North Americans and the people of East Asia. It's clear to researchers that people from prehistoric Japan fled across the Bering Land Bridge, bringing their primitive technologies with them to North America. Neanderthal Necklace In a dark and spooky cave, researchers have found what they say could be one of the final remnants of Neanderthal creativity. The Forodada Cave in Spain is located near the coast of the Mediterranean, in the province of Valencia. It was here around 40,000 years ago. Neanderthals lived dim, gloomy lives in caverns and underground dwellings. It was also here where archaeologists excavated what could be the last necklace ever made by our distant ancestors. The necklace was made with eagle talons and likely had symbolic or even religious importance to whoever made it. Excavations have been going on in the cave since the 1970s, but it was only recently that scientists started to find the real treasure. They came across a complete Neanderthal skeleton, believed to be the most complete ever found in the area. This individual lived at the very end of Neanderthal existence in Europe. Around the same time, researchers found the piece of jewelry. It came as a huge shock because the symbolic behavior of Neanderthals is widely unknown. Some scholars speculate they were just as creative as us, even creating their own primitive religion. Other scholars don't think the Neanderthals participated in the same symbolic behavior as human beings. Now, the existence of this personal ornament proves that during the final days of the Neanderthal, they were shockingly similar to Homo sapiens. Aliens on the Rocks Archaeologists have discovered mysterious cave paintings in the African nation of Tanzania. The strange art resembles anthropomorphic figures, what the experts say could be depictions of alien visitors. The discovery was initially made in 2018 in the Swaga Swaga Game Reserve. But only recently did scientists from Jagiellonian University in Poland secure the funding to travel to Tanzania and document the drawings. They identified the rock art as being many centuries old, though they haven't confirmed the exact age with any radiocarbon dating yet. The images were likely created by the ancestors of the local Sandawe people. They lived in the wilds of the region for thousands of years and left behind plenty of cave drawings. And yet, none of them are quite like the ones found in the game reserve. The drawings depict very peculiar humanoid-shaped figures. They appear to have the legs, arms, and bodies of humans, but their heads are all wrong. The heads are huge and red. It almost looks like the figure is wearing a massive space helmet. Researchers are still struggling to come to terms with what the ancient ancestors were drawing here. Some archaeologists with the university say the drawings are supposed to be depictions of humans mixed with animals. Others believe the ancient people met with visitors from the sky and drew them on the cave walls. Horror at a Mass Grave A mass grave discovered in Poland captured the horrifying moment that a man returned from a faraway journey to discover his family massacred. The gravesite is 5,000 years old, found in a small Polish village. The disturbing grave contains the bodies of men, women, and children, and all of them appear to have been brutally killed in a variety of ways. Most of them have smashed skulls from being bludgeoned. But this isn't just a gruesome murder scene. Archaeologists were a little confused to see that the people had been so brutally killed, then lined up formally and given a rich collection of valuables to be buried with. They were murdered and then buried with gentle care. Radiocarbon dating revealed the bodies to come from around 2880 BC. They belonged to the Globular Amphora community, a group distinguished by their unique artwork, spherical earthenware, and love for pigs. 
They live during a time when Europeans were forming new cultures and creating new identities. Tribes were getting bigger, and groups of people were beginning to come into conflict with groups that didn't look like them or who shared different beliefs. Researchers believe the globular amphora community likely had issues with the corded ware community living nearby. The mass grave discovered in Poland is likely all that remains of one tribe killing their neighbors. But here's where things get even weirder and more disturbing. Scientists investigated each and every body, and soon realized the grave was missing its fathers. There were a lot of mothers buried with their children, but no dads. There were male bodies, but not very many. It looks like the assault was launched while the fighting age men were away. This explains why the bodies were buried so tenderly, even though the victims were treated so badly. Maybe while the men were out fighting, their enemies came and killed all the women and children and everyone left behind. Then when the warriors got home, they tried to bury everyone with respect. Sounds like something right out of a movie. Weird Minoan Marriage Rules On the island of Crete in Greece, the Minoans blossomed as a powerful Bronze Age civilization around 3500 BC. They were one of the first advanced cultures in the Aegean Sea. They built huge palaces, mysterious subterranean labyrinths, and magnificent temples. They created a massive trading network, developed their own writing system, and made huge advancements in the world of art. Their existence was rediscovered at the beginning of the 20th century, and now we have a pretty good idea of who the Minoan people were. At least, we thought we did. Researchers from the Max Planck Institute recently analyzed the genomes of 100 people from Bronze Age Crete. They created a full biological family tree of a small hamlet from 3,600 years ago. The DNA revealed quite a bit, including some bizarre traditions. One of the strangest things found was that on Crete and other Greek islands, it was customary to marry your first cousin. There was a strict system of inter-family marriage that only existed in the waters of Greece and nowhere else in the ancient world. Lead author of this study, Irene Scortaniotti, said the revelation of the cousin marriages came as a huge surprise to everyone involved. Researchers believe the whole thing was to prevent inherited farmland from being divided outside the family. Minoans and other ancient civilizations in Greece wanted to keep farmland in the family. Since everyone knew marrying brothers and sisters was a bad idea, they took a step back to cousins, the jaguar and the starfish. At a mysterious Aztec altar in Mexico, archaeologists uncovered a very strange collection of corpses. Researchers with the National Institute of Archaeology and History uncovered a decaying jaguar skeleton at the Templo Mayor complex in Mexico City. This was the former capital of Tenochtitlan, jewel of the Aztec world. Most of the city's remains are currently buried under the modern Mexico City, with only a small collection revealed and excavated in the historic center. Templo Mayor is by far the most impressive and was a major site of religious importance to the Aztec people. They performed all manner of sacrifice here, and not all of their victims were human. Surrounding the jaguar skeleton were found a total of 160 starfish. The whole scene was incredibly strange. Over 500 years ago, a jaguar was slaughtered and then the starfish were placed delicately around its body. Scientists say the starfish could have been offerings to the two-faced god, who represented water and fire, and agriculture and war. But what the starfish had to do with the jaguar, and what the ritual was even about? Experts are totally stumped. Big shout out to Jackie and Dominican5683. Thanks so much for watching and supporting this channel. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. We'd love to have you. Swimming Humans the earliest humans swam 100,000 years ago. Today, you might be surprised to learn that most human beings living on the planet can't swim. People bathe and wash their clothes, but most people can't physically swim from one side of a river to another. Yet archaeologists say there was a time when almost everyone would have been able to swim. Researchers found that Neanderthals living in Italy swam with shocking ease. 
They discovered Neanderthal skeletons whose ear bones showed damage from swimmer's ear. The Neanderthals in Italy were diving at least 12 feet deep to retrieve clamshells that they needed to make tools. But then something bizarre happened. 23,000 years ago, the Ice Age started to end. Glaciers which had covered Poland, England, Germany, and much of North America suddenly began to melt. And that was when people stopped swimming. Fish didn't seem like such an important source of nutrition, and human beings began to farm wheat to make bread. Humans living in Eurasia no longer had enough vitamin D in their diet because of the lack of fish. The skin tone of these people began to change from dark black to light brown. This was an evolutionary adaptation to allow more sunlight to be absorbed through the skin to supply vitamin D. Some of these lighter-skinned people would migrate into Europe and become pale white, while others migrated into Persia. It seems like it was prehistoric people no longer wanting to swim that contributed to the sudden change of skin tone, pushing people to become more pale. The Boy and the Dogs Archaeologists recently discovered the grave of a child buried with 142 dogs. That would be weird enough on its own, but the grave was found in the middle of the Egyptian desert, 62 miles from Cairo in the wasteland known as the Fayum Oasis. The oasis itself isn't a wasteland, it is an oasis after all, but surrounding it on every side is nothing but harsh desert landscape. The ruins of ancient settlements, lost villages, and crumbling temples can be found scattered all over the place here. Ancient Egyptians associated the oasis with the crocodile god Sobek and dedicated many cities and temples in his honor. For years, researchers have been excavating a giant necropolis outside the oasis. The necropolis was used between the 4th century BC and 7th century AD. By far, the most outlandish discovery here has been the 8-year-old child placed gently on the ghastly remains of 142 dogs. Zoologist Galina Belova examined the remains of the canines and concluded they all died at the exact same time. Yet they were not killed by any kind of violence. Instead, they probably drowned. But why the child was buried with them is a startling mystery nobody seems able to solve. The boy was also buried with a linen bag on his head, which again, no one can explain. King Solomon's Throne The throne of King Solomon was said to be the most fabulous and luxurious seat that any ruler ever sat upon. It was made from pure ivory, covered in gold, and bedazzled with rubies, emeralds, sapphires, and many other precious stones. It sat upon a podium reached by six steps with each step built in the likeness of an animal. The first was a golden lion, the next a golden wolf, the third a tiger, an eagle, then a cat, and finally a golden hawk. Rising over the throne was a menorah of pure gold, and beside the throne were more golden chairs reserved for the high priests who sat beside the king. This marvelous chair is one of archaeology's greatest and strangest mysteries. According to legends, it was stolen by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon over 2,000 years ago. Then, when King Darius of Persia conquered Babylon, he stole the throne and brought it with him to Medea. Nobody knows where the throne is today. There are many recreations across the world, like the throne of Charlemagne in Aachen, used as the throne of the coronation of the Holy Roman Emperors until 1531. The throne chair of Denmark was inspired by the throne of Solomon, but no one has any idea where the physical chair went, or if it ever even existed at all. New Year's Resolutions You may be surprised to learn that the tradition of coming up with a New Year's resolution has been around for the past 4,000 years. Scientists trace the idea back to the Babylonians. These days, the New Year's resolution is something you come up with to better yourself. These are generally goals for self-improvement, like getting into shape or stop watching so much TV. But for the ancient Babylonians, the new year was a time to make promises to their gods. Scientists even say the Babylonians were more likely to follow through with their resolutions than modern people. Because for them, a promise kept to the gods meant great fortunes ahead. But a broken promise meant the gods would be angered and that for the next 12 months, their lives would be miserable. 
The other big difference was that the Babylonian New Year was in March. They saw the beginning of the new year as spring, which makes sense when you think about it. The new year didn't start in the middle of winter, during the coldest and most miserable month. The Babylonian New Year began when the world was renewed in spring. The Romans continued the tradition of making yearly resolutions. It even continued into the medieval era, with knights making their valiant vows at the end of each year. They would make an oath, which they needed to keep in the following year to maintain their knightly status. Ancient Battle Sword At the Field Museum in Chicago, there is a sword that's been sitting in their collection for almost a century. Curators at the museum had always believed the sword was a replica, and so they never thought much of it. But while they were preparing for an upcoming exhibition, they took a closer look at the weapon. The bronze sword was initially acquired after it was pulled out of the Danube River in Budapest during archaeological work in the 1930s. It was put straight into storage and kept there ever since. But now everything has changed. Researchers believe the sword is 3,000 years old and was used in battle to slaughter people. Warriors during the Bronze Age would toss their weapons and even their armor into lakes and rivers to commemorate those lost in battle. Curator of anthropology William Parkinson described the trend as burying the hatchet. Bronze Age people left tons of weapons and armor throughout European lakes, and every now and again, someone pulls one out of the muck. Unfortunately for the exhibition, the sword was not able to be included because it was identified too late. Instead, it will be installed in the main hall as a preview. The new exhibition, titled First Kings of Europe, takes a look at how the agrarian villages of the Balkans evolved to become wealthy kingdoms from between 6,000 and 500 BC. Giants of the Earth According to the Bible, giants once roamed the earth. They were called Nephilim, and they were the unholy union of sinful angels and human women. They were giant beasts who corrupted the land and forced God to purge them from the planet with a great flood. They told similar stories of giant beings walking the face of the earth in the ancient myths of Sumer and Akkad. The Greeks also had stories with many similarities, as did the Native Americans. Almost every other ancient civilization told tales of giants. Giants and their existence have caused a lot of controversy over the years. Modern archaeologists say they have never found any evidence of giant beings. Some take it to mean that that says the Bible is wrong and that there is no truth to any of the global stories. There have allegedly been giant skeletons found throughout places like Arkansas and the Deep South, in China, ancient Rome, and even in biblical Israel. Yet every time one of these giants is found, it's dismissed as a hoax, and all proof of it vanishes. The Noble Woman's Grave Researchers have been hard at work excavating the burial of a medieval noblewoman in England. The grave is about 1,300 years old and was found in Northampton. Archaeologists retrieved from the grave what might just be the most elaborate necklace ever found in England from the medieval days. According to the Museum of London Archaeology, the necklace is of international importance. The grave itself could even hold the most significant medieval female buried anywhere in England. It's not clear who this woman was, but the artifacts in her grave suggest she may have been an early religious leader. The necklace she was buried with included a myriad of opulent gems from all across Europe. Researchers also discovered a massive silver cross that had been placed delicately on her body. The cross is decorated in human faces with each one cast in silver and given blue glass eyes. These may be representations of Jesus Christ's 12 apostles. The huge silver cross also had a precious garnet embedded in its center. Such an artifact buried with someone 1,300 years ago would typically suggest they were a Christian leader. But this was a woman who lived around 630 AD and Christianity has never been about women holding positions of power. Even in the 7th century, women were typically excluded from church activities and never given any kind of authority. Researchers aren't sure if this woman was exalted in her community despite the church's harsh ideals on women. She may have even been a pagan leader fighting against the doctrines of the church. All we really know is that she was very important 
perhaps even the most important woman of her time in England. Lost in China The tomb of Duke Jing of Qin is the largest tomb that's ever been excavated in China. If you were to ask anyone what they thought the most impressive tomb in China is, they would almost certainly say the tomb of Qin Shi Huang, where the terracotta warriors were found. But the truth is that Qin Gong's tomb is positively massive. However, it's also a little disturbing. It was found in 1976 in Shanxi province, and it took 10 years to excavate. The tomb was built like an inverted pyramid, eight stories deep and bigger than most Chinese palaces. The tomb was for the 18th ruler of the Zhao dynasty, Shen Gong. He ruled between 576 and 537 BC, about 300 years before Qin Shi Huang unified China under a single ruler. What makes his tomb so exciting, creepy, and intriguing is that it was filled with human remains. Archaeologists identified 186 human remains inside the tomb. These weren't people who died of natural causes, either. They were victims of funeral sacrifice. This was a practice that started around 678 BC and lasted an entire three centuries. Rulers of China would have dozens of people murdered and buried in their tombs so that they could serve them in the afterlife. The horrendous practice was finally abolished by Duke Xian in 384 BC. It's shout out time! I want to give a big thank you to Jade Repay Finerty and Dale Leander Toller for supporting this channel. Thanks so much, guys! If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. We'd love to have you! Neanderthal Butchering Site Neanderthals may have been a lot more efficient than anyone could have imagined. Recent evidence has surfaced of Neanderthals hunting and butchering massive prehistoric elephants. About 125,000 years ago, long before the earliest Homo sapiens were out hunting mammoths, Neanderthals were advancing as a society. They worked in organized groups to take down beasts the size of dinosaurs. Then they used the meat to feed hundreds of their own people. Evidence came from over 3,000 prehistoric elephant remains discovered in central Germany in the 1980s and 90s. Researchers dug up entire skeletons, random bones, and even found elephant stomachs. The extinct species of straight-tusked elephant stood a whopping 13 feet tall and weighed 13 tons. That's about the size of eight standard cars. They were the largest land mammals that lived during the Pleistocene era. Researchers recently decided to take a closer look at some of these prehistoric elephant bones, and that was when they found cut marks on the surface. Physical evidence that Neanderthals carefully butchered these enormous animals. It appears they harvested not only the elephant's meat, but the fat and brains as well. This was all taking place at a single site for over 2,000 years, suggesting generations of giant elephant hunters. A single straight-tusked elephant would have yielded over 25,000 daily portions of about 4,000 calories. In other words, enough food to feed a tribe of Neanderthals, about 25 individuals, for three straight months. Co-author of this study, Will Robrex, called the elephants walkie calorie bombs. Anyone curious what prehistoric elephant meat tasted like? The Viking Great Army A team of scientists from Britain and Belgium have revealed some shocking new details about the Viking Great Army. This was the group of legendary fighters that invaded England in the 9th century and brought with them great destruction. The team of scientists completed a chemical analysis of material they found at a Viking cremation site in England. And, so far as we know, it's the only cremation site in the British Isles left behind by the Vikings. The dating of the site suggests that the people who were burned here were part of the Great Army. Cremation is an important detail because in the 9th century, England was firmly Christian. Nobody was cremated because bodies were buried instead. Cremation was a much more pagan type of funerary tradition. This shows that when the Viking Great Army arrived, they weren't too concerned with the local Christian customs. But the analysis of skeletal samples found in the cremation piles shows that not everyone burned here was from Scandinavia. 
Many of the dead were from England. This is a major discovery and something that could change what we know about Viking history. We already know the army arrived in 865 AD and launched a massive invasion of the British Isles. But discovering the skeletal remains of locals changes a lot. It means the Vikings accepted local dissidents into their ranks, swelling their army as they fought against the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms for dominance of Britain. The Sanctuary of Mithras Archaeologists in Spain have found an ancient sanctuary dedicated to the mysterious god Mithras, who was worshipped throughout the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago. Archaeologists were excavating the Villa del Mitra, a complex of fragmented ruins in Cabra, when they came across the sanctuary, and they were shocked to find the remains of ritual banquets, vestiges of feasts that had once taken place inside its very walls. For those out of the loop, Mithraism was one of the most popular religions the world had ever seen. It likely had its origins in Iran, but it was quickly popularized by Romans in the 1st century AD. They took the lore behind the sun god Mithra and transformed it into an underground mystery cult. Within a few decades, Mithras was everywhere. People were worshipping in secret subterranean sanctuaries all the way from England to Turkey. And yet, despite its fame, modern historians still don't know the exact details of their religion. We know there may have been sacrificing involved, and that it had something to do with death and resurrection. But their religion was so secretive, no documents survive today describing its rites and passages. The archaeologists behind this discovery came from several different universities in Spain. The villa was first excavated in 1972, and subsequent digs in the 80s unearthed the remains of an ancient subfloor heating system. But it wasn't until just recently that researchers got to the bottom of the lost sanctuary. The building was improved in the 3rd century AD, right before Mithraism was defeated by Christianity. Do you think you'd be open to Mithraism if you lived in the Roman Empire? Let us know in the comments below! And while you're at it, be sure to subscribe! The Face of Nabatea Saudi Arabia has just unveiled the breathtaking reconstruction of an ancient Nabatean woman. It took several years of painstaking work by skilled historians and archaeologists. The reconstruction was modeled off the remains of a real person, a woman named Hinat whose tomb was found in Higra in 2015. She lived 2,000 years ago in northwestern Saudi Arabia and was buried in the ancient oasis city of Alula. But who were the Nabataeans? They were one of the most important Arab civilizations of the past two millennia. Their capital was the ancient city of Petra, which is currently Jordan's premier tourist destination. Petra was an international trading hub and an important stop on the Silk Road, where people traded spices, textiles, and medicine. And this was all facilitated by the powerful kingdom of Nabatea. However, they had too much power, and their Roman neighbors to the west didn't like it. It wasn't long before the Romans wiped them out, banishing the Nabataeans to the desert and causing Petra to fall into ruin. It was the end of a civilization that was responsible for the earliest pieces of the modern Arabic alphabet. Hinat died before Nabatea was destroyed by the Romans. Researchers used the bone fragments found in her tomb to create a model of her face. Then, using modern technology, her face was brought back to life with a 3D printer. Sure, a little bit of creativity does go into facial reconstruction. But this is still the first time a person from this lost civilization has been brought to life in such a way. Hinat is now on display at the Hegra Welcome Center in Alula. The Bjornstad Ship The Bjornstad Ship is likely the biggest rock carving found anywhere in northern Europe. It's absolutely huge, standing about 14 feet long and 5 feet high. It was carved into the face of a massive boulder in the countryside of Norway over a thousand years ago. But nobody knows exactly when the rock was carved, or who was responsible for creating it. It's true that the Vikings created plenty of rune stones between the 8th and 11th centuries, but this carving predates the Viking Age. This was an older culture in Scandinavia who took so much pride in their ships 
that they etched pictures of them onto rock boulders. But who in the world came before the Vikings? Thousands of years before the people we know as the Vikings rose to power, Scandinavia was ruled by semi-nomadic clans. They built ships, they hunted, and they even endured the freezing cold of the northern landscape. But scientists don't really know many specifics about the Nordic Bronze Age. Researchers know basically nothing of Scandinavian culture up until the Norsemen appeared, followed by the Vikings. The Bjornstad ship, created during the Bronze Age, is one of the very few pieces of evidence of the hunter-gatherers and shipbuilders who lived before the Vikings. It was found in 1946 and shows a warship with enough seats to fit 40 rowers. Deer Antler Instruments In Vietnam, researchers discovered a pair of ancient instruments made from deer antlers hiding in a museum storage closet. These are now the oldest stringed instruments ever found in Southeast Asia, and they were just collecting dust. They were initially excavated in Vietnam in the 1990s, but nobody realized what they were. The artifacts were stuffed in museum storage and abandoned until scientists stumbled upon them by accident. After a fresh look, it became clear that these were very important relics. We now know the deer antlers were fashioned into string instruments about 2,000 years ago by the pre oc eo culture. This was a powerful group of tribal warriors who thrived in the Mekong Delta starting in the 2nd century BC. They were the ancestors of modern Vietnamese people, and just like other cultures around the globe, they loved music. After conducting several studies, researchers now believe the deer antler instruments represent the earliest chordophones found in Southeast Asia. It's likely the instruments served an important role in rituals and ceremonies for centuries. The instrument was played by drawing a bow across the tight string, not unlike a violin. Only these ancient instruments are more like the traditional kni, another one-stringed instrument crafted from bamboo. Ancient Gaza Sarcophagus An ancient sarcophagus has just been discovered in Gaza in shockingly good condition. It dates back 2,000 years to the Roman era and was found in the Gaza Strip, not to be confused with Giza in Egypt. The sarcophagus was part of a huge Roman necropolis that was discovered in 2022. So far, international researchers have identified about 90 individual graves throughout the cemetery. But the sarcophagus has garnished special attention because it likely belonged to a very prominent individual. The necropolis could have been used for burying all kinds of people, but to be put in a lead-lined coffin was a big deal. Laura Burnett from the Portable Antiquities Scheme says in Roman times, lead coffins were considered a fancy way to be buried. Amazingly, nobody has opened the sarcophagus yet. Scientists placed it inside a protective wooden container and are leaving it to be studied by professionals in perfect conditions. It's a rare opportunity to investigate a fully sealed sarcophagus without cracking it open and exposing the corpse to air for the first time in 2,000 years. Be sure to stay tuned and as soon as we find out what's inside, we'll let you know. Rare Inca Tunic an extremely rare tunic was discovered in a grave in northern Chile. According to researchers from the George Washington University, it was known as an uncu, an article of clothing worn during the rule of the Inca Empire. Researchers believe the tunic was worn by a man of great prestige, since such pieces of cloth were typically reserved for imperial authorities. The uncu was held to very specific design standards, which were controlled by the Inca government. It was almost like a government-mandated uniform, but it was a tunic, a simple piece of cloth that's worn around the waist. What's really interesting about this particular unku is that it was found hundreds of miles from the Inca capital of Cusco. It was found in northern Chile, which would have been a remote part of the empire, absorbed into the Inca realm in the 15th century. This was only a few years before the Spanish arrived and the Inca were destroyed. The tunic is similar to others found closer to the capital, and its style is very much in line with the design standards of the day. But it also shows some subtle cultural features unique to the area. It's an excellent example of just how powerful the Inca Empire was during their prime, and how far their influence extended. 
The Pirate's Skull Archaeologists found a skull impaled with a big, pointy spike. The skull belonged to a German pirate in the 14th century. It's one of the most gruesome skulls currently on display in any museum in the world. The skull belonged to Klaus Stortebecker. If the historical records are to be believed, Klaus was the leader of a group of privateers who called themselves the Victual Brothers. He lived and pillaged in the late 1300s, originally hired to fight in the war between Denmark and Sweden. It was the Swedish who hired the privateers to keep the Danish at bay while ensuring provisions were able to reach the Swedish capital. But then, when the war was over, Klaus and his gang kept on pillaging merchant vessels. They turned into pirates. But as you may know already, based on his skull having a spike through it, things didn't end well. Legend has it that Klaus was captured in 1401, sentenced to death, and then beheaded. His head was put on a spike as a warning to other pirates. The skull was found in 1878 on a small island in the Elbe River. It was the same island where Klaus and his entire crew were put to death. The skull was later put in a display cabinet at the Hamburg Museum, where it stayed for decades. But in January of 2010, it was stolen. It wouldn't be for a year until the skull was discovered by police and brought back to the museum. After it was put back into its glass cabinet, the pirate's skull was given some added protection with a new security system. Who would want to steal a pirate's skull? Magical Pagan Masks In the 1960s, archaeologists in Poland made a pair of discoveries that were nothing short of fantastic. A medieval fortress was unveiled in the city of Opole. Inside the fortress, they found two wooden objects believed to be ancient Slavic ritual masks. Researchers assumed the masks were used during secretive pagan celebrations, held in dark corners because the participants had to hide from the Christians. If you got caught practicing pagan rituals in the Middle Ages, chances are you would be burned at the stake. The masks were exceptionally creepy. They were found hidden among layers of garbage between pieces of the fortress, which was built in the 11th century. The masks were fairly simple, made from local wood and carved with a pair of holes for the eyes and a single hole for the mouth. People used to use masks like these during ceremonies to communicate with the gods and spirits of the natural land. It's shout out time! I want to say a big thank you to Tazilla Simon for the super thanks! Thank you so much for your generous support! Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and join the Origins Explained family, because why not? Spines on Sticks in Peru, archaeologists have come across a collection of morbid artifacts. They found human vertebrae threaded on sticks, looking like bone clubs. The horrific relics were found in Peru's Chincha Valley, distributed through a series of elaborate tombs. The region in which these sickening objects were discovered was once ruled by the mighty Chincha Kingdom. They had control over the coastal region from roughly 900 AD until the Inca Empire showed up in the 15th century. Just like so many smaller kingdoms in Peru, the Chincha were annihilated by the Inca. But why did the Chincha practice threading vertebrae onto sticks? If you're having a hard time imagining this in your head, just picture someone ripping out your spine and then shoving a stick through it, making it into a kind of staff with your skull at the top. That's exactly what was found here in the valley. Scientists are aware of over 192 sets of vertebrae. They have analyzed as many as they can, surprised to see many of them belong to people under the age of 20. They all came from humans buried in the early 1500s, right around the time the Spanish arrived. Even stranger is that many of the spines on sticks were made after the people were dead, upwards of 40 years later. It's a total mystery. What it looks like is that after the Spanish arrived, the Chincha started digging up the graves of their dead and then making ornaments out of their bones. It could have something to do with ancestral worship, but the truth is we just don't understand it. Double Trepanation Scientists in central Italy discovered the skull of a medieval woman who experienced some serious medical trauma. You may have heard of the practice of trepanation before. When a piece of someone's skull is removed to alleviate pressure inside the skull cavity, this is often something that needs to be done following a head injury. Evidence has been found of such surgeries going back over 5,000 years in Europe. 
People were doing brain surgery with nothing but sharpened rocks. In medieval Italy, they at least had metal tools and access to better medicines. But brain surgery still wasn't something most people would subject themselves to willingly. This particular medieval woman, who lived around the 6th century, had to go through two brain surgeries. This is a rare example of someone who had their skull opened twice. She was 50 years old at the time. Her skull was excavated from a cemetery on the grounds of Castel Trocino back in the 19th century. Archaeologists recently looked over the skulls discovered, but found only a few of them in good enough shape to really study. They were shocked when they discovered evidence of the woman's double trepanations. The researchers were even more astounded when they couldn't come up with a logical reason for why she had needed the surgeries. There wasn't anything obvious they could find to warrant such invasive procedures. The most remarkable part of all is that she survived them both. According to Iliana Micarelli from the University of Cambridge, the medieval woman survived a series of successful drillings into her skull. Whatever had been bothering her must have been very severe. We can only hope the surgeries made her life better. The Mermaid Mummy Japan is home to a mermaid, but not one that you might expect. It has been housed inside a Japanese temple for hundreds of years. It's one of the most ghoulish and disgusting artifacts in the world. The mummy obviously isn't a mythical mermaid, but the truth is even more disturbing. In 2022, the mummified mermaid was handed over to scientists as part of a new study. The Japanese temple where it was housed, located in Okayama, finally agreed to let scientists get their hands on the coveted mermaid. At the time, researchers figured it was just a plain old monkey torso sewn onto the body of a fish. But after researchers from the Kurashiki University of Science and Arts did CT scans and x-rays along with DNA analysis, they made some bizarre discoveries. The test confirmed the mermaid's torso was not that of a monkey, but made entirely of cloth, paper, and colored with a sand and charcoal paste. But the torso was covered in bits and pieces from other animals. The mermaid was part pufferfish, made up of some other fish, and found to have traces of keratin from an unknown creature. There was no monkey harmed in the creation of the mermaid. As for where it came from, the specimen was captured by a fisherman around 1736. Thanks to this new study, though, it's obvious the mermaid was created by a person as a hoax. The hoax looked real enough, and so it was put in a glass case at the temple and worshipped for over a century. Stone Teeth Archaeologists in Mexico have discovered a bizarre skeleton with stone teeth near the ancient ruins of Teotihuacan. The skeleton is about 1,600 years old and belonged to a woman in her late 30s. She was buried in an impressive tomb with 19 jars of sacrificial offerings. According to the National Anthropology and History Institute, she also had an elongated skull that made her look like an alien. The woman's skull was formed during a long and probably very painful process involving compression. This was a fairly common technique used in some parts of Mesoamerica. However, the discovery was a bit of a shock since the ancient people of Teotihuacan didn't typically practice it. This means the woman was likely a foreigner and likely stuck out in society with her pylon-shaped head. She's been dubbed by researchers as the woman of Tlelotracan, named after the neighborhood where she was discovered. Not only was her head deformed, but her teeth were encrusted with stones. If you think a trip to the dentist is bad today, imagine getting prosthetic teeth made in the 3rd century. She wore one tooth that was made from solid green stone and had many other stones embedded in her teeth. This is one of the most unusual skulls found in the ancient lost city, and researchers don't know who the woman was. The Baby Portrait A farmer in England recently left behind what might be the creepiest 17th century portrait in the world. For years, the painting of an extraordinarily creepy baby was hanging on the back of a door, a door that always happened to be open. For that reason, the thing was rarely looked at. After the eccentric owner of the farm, who had crammed his cottage full of antiques and oddities, passed away, others found the painting. The painting was then put up for auction in London where it was estimated to fetch upwards of $24,000. The reason it wouldn't get more was because of the subject matter. The auction house responsible for selling the piece called the portrait subject a miniature adult, but you could also call it a perversely large baby.
The painting was made 400 years ago. It shows what appears to be a toddler dressed in fancy robes and looking straight at the viewer with an expression of utter apathy. The thing that's really disturbing is that because of the proportions, the baby looks to be about four feet tall. The painting doesn't seem to have a name, but was made by Adrian Verkins in 1626. Would you allow this painting to be put up in your house? Or would you spend $24,000 for it? Let me know in the comments. The Lady from Basel In 1975, specialists were called in to complete renovations at the historic Barfuser Church in Switzerland. During the excavations, the archaeological department found hundreds of ancient burial sites. One of them proved to be spectacular. The grave had thick brick walls and was hidden underneath the choir in a secret chamber. Inside the grave were two coffins, both of them sitting on a pile of bones. In the first coffin was the skeleton of a mysterious female. In the second was the mummified corpse of a different woman. Amidst all the bones and skulls was an almost perfectly preserved mummy. The identity of the mystery mummy remained a secret until 2015, when archaeologists were able to use modern methods for their investigation. They were able to look inside the mummy, where they found evidence of gallstones and a huge amount of mercury. It was most likely the mercury that prevented decay and allowed for the body to become mummified. The woman also lost all her teeth at some point and underwent surgery. All clues pointed to the woman being part of a local privileged class. After all, she was buried underneath the church in a spot reserved for high clergymen. By combing through church documents, researchers were finally able to identify the mystery mummy as Anna Katharina Biskov, born 1719 and died 1787. But she's mostly known as the Lady from Basel. Pakal the Great's Death Mask The Jade Death Mask of Pakal the Great is currently on display in a replica tomb in Mexico City. The mask is not necessarily scary or frightening, but it is unnerving. It was found in 1952 during excavations at the Temple of Inscriptions in the lost Mayan city of Palenque. For over 1,000 years, the death mask had been lying in utter darkness in the tomb, covering the rapidly decaying skull of one of the Maya's greatest jungle rulers. Pakal the Great was one of the longest reigning monarchs in human history, ascending the throne at 12 years old and staying in power for 68 years. This was all during the 7th century, about 1400 years ago. He was alive and in control for so long that he became a kind of mythical figure, like a god-king. When he died, he was given a hugely impressive burial. His tomb was hidden at the end of a tunnel underneath the great temple in Palenque, and among the treasures left with him was his death mask. It's made almost entirely of jade, with white beady eyes and soulless black pupils. The Meroe Head The Meroe Head is exactly what it sounds like. It's a giant head. It was found underneath a temple in the ruins of the ancient African city of Meroe, located in what is now Sudan. Scientists think the head was part of a gigantic statue of Julius Caesar Augustus, first emperor of Rome circa 31 BC. Caesar was the man who defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra, Egypt's final pharaoh. He helped change Rome from a republic into an empire, moving from a system of democracy to a system of tyranny and dictatorship. After Caesar Augustus largely destroyed the Roman Senate and appointed himself supreme leader of Rome and Egypt, he started building statues. Augustus Caesar wanted everyone to be reminded of who was in charge of whom. He also may have been a giant narcissist, it's difficult to say. Whatever the case, he had statues built all over the place as a reminder to the Egyptians of Rome's might. The Meroe head was part of one of these statues, but it wasn't built in the same place it was found. There had always been bad blood between Nubia and Egypt. In 25 BC, Nubian forces attacked a handful of cities along the Nile. They also pillaged a lot of statues, one of them being of Augustus Caesar. For some strange reason, they stole the head of Rome's new emperor. Then it got lost underneath a temple in the city of Meroe for 2,000 years. Thanks for watching! Which discovery was your favorite? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. See you next time. Bye.